Welcome to today's podcast of Places, People, Purpose. Today we are going to explore the south rim of the Grand Canyon, which is the most widely visited part of the canyon. Before jumping into today's episode, we'd like to recommend a wonderful and comprehensive resource that was used both during our trip to the canyon and in writing these podcasts, and that is the book titled Grand Canyon The Complete Guide by James Kaiser. It is just a great book on the canyon, and we would highly recommend it to anyone who is either going to visit the Grand Canyon or would just like to know more about this mesmerizing and special place. If you'd like to purchase a copy of this book, we have it on the Our Favorites page of our website, placespeoplepurpose.com. The South Rim serves as the primary entrance to the Grand Canyon National Park and is home to the Grand Canyon Village. This hub offers visitors an array of services, including visitor centers, accommodations, restaurants, and gift shops. The village is an excellent starting point for exploring the South Rim. The South Rim is divided into three main areas the Grand Canyon Village, Hermit Road, and Desert View Drive. Nearly all of the park's hotels, restaurants, and shops are located around the Grand Canyon Village, which is at an elevation of 6,800 feet. To reduce traffic, the park offers free shuttles between popular points. From its stunning viewpoints to its rich cultural history, the South Rim of the Grand Canyon promises an unforgettable experience for nature enthusiasts and adventurers alike. The South Rim boasts numerous viewpoints that provide breathtaking panoramic vistas of the Grand Canyon. Some of the most iconic viewpoints include Mather Point, Yavapai Point, and Hopi Point. Each offers a unique perspective of the canyon's vastness and complexity, making it an ideal spot for photography, contemplation, and enjoyment. Mather Point is the Grand Canyon's most popular viewpoint, but this could be due to its close proximity to the visitor center. The views are amazing, and it is a great place to view the sunrise. From Mather Point, you can see one-third of the total Grand Canyon. Mather Point is named for Stephen Mather, who was a wealthy industrialist who was the first director of the National Park Service. In 1914, Mather complained to Interior Secretary Franklin Lane about the management of America's national parks. Lane essentially told Mather, if you don't like the way the national parks are being run, Come on down to Washington and run them yourself. Well, that's exactly what Mather did as he spent the next 13 years shaping a strong vision for America's national parks. Yavapai Point arguably offers the best views near the Grand Canyon Village. The point juts out into the canyon so you can enjoy wonderful east and west panoramic views which are great for catching both sunrises and sunsets. Yavapai Point is also the setting for the canyon's first museum, which was constructed in 1928. The Yavapai Geology Museum is a great place to learn about Grand Canyon geology. The Hopi House is a rustic stone building that celebrates the cultures of the native people who call the Grand Canyon home. The Hopi House was designed by Mary Coulter and has a stone exterior, thatched ceilings, and mud-plastered interior walls, 
which are all characteristic of traditional Hopi architecture. There are tiny windows that let in a minimum of sunlight that keeps the interior cool and refreshing in summer. When the Hopi house opened in 1905, one family lived there for three generations. Hopi House offered Grand Canyon visitors a wonderful glimpse into the Southwest's indigenous cultures. Today, the Hopi House continues its century-old tradition of selling authentic, high-quality Native crafts. There are Navajo blankets and Hopi kachina dolls for sale, as well as baskets, pottery, and jewelry from tribes across the Southwest. If you'd like to learn more about the cultures that are indigenous to this area, there is also a good selection of books on this topic. Mary Coulter is actually the Grand Canyon's most famous architect. Mary grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota and was captivated by the artwork of local Sioux Indians. After graduating from design school, she was hired by the Fred Harvey Company to decorate the interior of an Indian building at the Alvarado Hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Coulter designed a tasteful space that not only displayed native crafts for sale, but also paid homage to the cultures behind them. The Fred Harvey Company recognized Coulter's talent and hired her to design a new Indian arts building next to the new luxury hotel it was planning at the Grand Canyon. That hotel was the El Tovar, which still offers the finest lodging at the canyon today. The Indian Arts Building became known as the Hopi House, and it was inspired by a 900-year-old pueblo located 80 miles west of the Grand Canyon called Old Oribe. Coulter embraced the local native architecture and meticulously studied Hopi design and construction. She insisted on working with local materials that blended seamlessly with the natural environment, as she wanted the building to complement the landscape, not compete with it. The Hopi House opened to wide acclaim, and Coulter went on to design the Lookout Studio, Hermit's Rest, Phantom Ranch, Bright Angel Lodge, and her masterpiece, the Desert View Watchtower. Mary was a strong-willed woman with amazing energy, and like most people with these personal traits, she ruffled a lot of feathers. She was a perfectionist, and she drove workmen crazy in her quest to create her own brand of perfection. She wanted to create something timeless, and today her buildings are among the most celebrated and popular in the Grand Canyon. Speaking of Bright Angel Lodge, this former lodge is now a small museum that is situated on a very dramatic section of the South Rim. The building has a fireplace that is built out of actual Grand Canyon rocks, which are arranged from floor to ceiling in their proper geological sequence. The original Bright Angel Lodge was the first overnight accommodations that were offered in the Grand Canyon Village. When it opened in 1896, guests could stay either at the hotel or at a nearby tent camp. The hotel later expanded to include a log cabin with eight guest rooms. The cabin rooms rented for $2.50 a night, and the tents went for $1.50. Oh, the good old days. As we indicated, Bright Angel Lodge was designed by Mary Coulter in the 1930s. Also on the South Rim is the Santa Fe train depot. This rustic train station is the only train station in a U.S. national park, and it's the last active train station to be built entirely out of logs. Train service began to the South Rim in 1901, where visitors could travel from Williams, Arizona to the South Rim in about four hours 
at a cost of $3.50. Before the train was available, the most dependable form of transportation was a bumpy all-day stagecoach ride that cost $20. Within a few years though, most people were traveling by car and the railroad had to shut down in 1968. In 1989, with traffic and congestion increasing in the park, the convenience of the railroad enabled it to come back to life. Today, there are daily departures on the train from Williams, Arizona. The trip takes two hours and 15 minutes for each one-way trip. That's all we have for today and today's episode about the Grand Canyon. If you enjoyed our podcast, please follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Tomorrow, we will discover more exciting information about the Grand Canyon. We look forward to having you with us for our next episode of Places, People, Purpose, where we create connections to our world.